Welcome to the to the afternoon session 4B. I would I'm going to get resettled here. Thank you. Um, this one's on weather and climate, and I would invite you guys to remember to post any questions or topics for discussion that you have in the Slack. You'll see that link a couple of times in the chat. And then I'm not going to waste any time to introduce our first speaker, Shashun Shen, who is going to be presenting on learning UFS state dependent systematic errors from the analysis increments. Um, is my screen sharing right now? Yes, looks good. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sejin Chen. Um, I'm from Series of CU Boulder and NOAA PSL. So I'll be sharing with you about um, learning systematic error of UFS, our operational global weather forecasting model, um, using the analysis increments from data simulation. So the motivation is, of course, to address model error for short-term forecasts. And we already hear from some talks yesterday discussing about the approximations we made or terms neglected because that of uh, computational power. So also there's a representation of interaction between the atmosphere and other Earth system components that are not perfect. Um, yeah. So today um, it's, um, it is still hard to find any other algorithm that provides better prediction for at least time more than several days for full 3D atmospheric states. So the idea is that we accept the fact that the model is not perfect and use machine learning to correct the model. So this is um, so this uh, bottom is showing a very nice result from Pathak et al. 2018. They showed that uh, hybrid forecasting, which is a machine learning corrected model, outperforms the imperfect model or um, the ML emulation, emul emulation alone. So many people are trying to do this um, from different perspectives. Uh, and the unique aspect of this study is that um, working with a state-of-the-art operational weather model, we don't really have a truth or high-resolution simulations to learn from. So the next best thing we have is the analysis field from data simulation. So for people who don't know what data simulation is, it is an algorithm that optimally combines the observation with the short-term forecast, like six-hour forecast, to get the best estimation of the um, atmospheric states. So this six-hourly correction from data simulation is called uh, analysis increments. And there are studies um, indicating that these analysis increments contains useful information about model errors. So here is an example of the annually average temperature analysis increment as a function of um, UTC time and uh, different model levels. So it is showing um, clearly for a different model level a clear diurnal cycle. So another study showed that if they apply a fixed correction of a three month um, running average of analysis increments, it improves the Navy weather forecasting model skills. So this is showing uh, um, the bias of um, 500 hitapascal of geopotential height of the Navy model, Navy model forecast. So it is clear um, that the corrected forecast is better for at least 10 days. But you can see after around six days, the bias started to flip sign and grow larger um, towards the opposite direction. So this is because um, they're applying the same correction throughout all lead times. So the question we're trying to answer here is that can we extract the state-dependent bias information from the analysis increment and apply for a different um, forecast condition? So a bit more on the problem statement. Um, there are two goals. Um, one is um, the mapping between the six hour forecast field and the corresponding bias. Um, but here we are approximating um, the bias using analysis increment. So secondly, we want to gain some um, insight about the bias characteristics of the model. So the bias information is kind of embedded inside the noisy um, analysis increment, and we're using machine learning to distill this information. Um, the main assumption here is that if there is a model error, then the data simulation would keep correcting the forecast in certain ways. 
Um, so we are really looking for the components in the analysis increment that can be related to the forecast field and some under conditions. So here I listed two um, targeted applications. So the first one is obviously um, to improve the quality of weather forecast and analysis. Um, and the second is um, to apply this ML correction in the reanalysis. So the figure on the left is showing the reanalysis re and observations of the global mean um, precipitation over 30 years. And if you look at the black lines, um, so it's the observation and it doesn't show any clear shift in climate. But if you look at one of the analysis, it shows these jumps um, every time when there is a significant change in the observing system. And this is mainly due to model error. And in the past, we do not have um, those new um, observations to correct the model climate. But with ML correction, um, we can actually go back in time and apply these, the same data simulation correction learned from today's observation to correct um, bias in the past. So um, here are some specifics about the training. So I got only one and a half year of data. So one year should be used for training to capture at least the annual cycle. Um, and we'll need to um, wait for more data to do testing. Um, the model was originally in one eighth degree resolution, but we did a spectral truncation um, to convert it to six um, degrees, assuming most um, bias we're interested in are in the larger scale. Um, and we started with a similar training um, setup um, to what ECMWF did last year. Um, it's a column-based model. So we don't ingest the whole 3D field at once, uh, but column by column. So the input, uh, so we input a column of all the variables and some boundary conditions, and then we train a neural network to out, uh, output the corresponding column of analysis increments. And I'm um, showing today only the results of the temperature bias, uh, but we do other variables too. So let's take a look at the um, current performance. So uh, we created a few baselines just to um, assess how well the uh, neural network is doing. So from the training data, uh, we come up with uh, annual average, um, three month running average, and uh, three month running average for each hour of the day. And the metric I'm using here um, is to measure how much of the target is predicted. So 100% means um, it's perfect, 0% um, means no harm, no gain, and negative means that the bias correction will harm the forecast. So surprisingly, using an annual mean, we can get already 20%. Um, and by including um, seasonal cycle, we get 33%. Um, and further including the annual cycle, we get 35%. Um, and by using neural network, we are able to relate 50% of the um, analysis increment um, to our input. So upper right um, is showing the squared of target temperature increments for different model levels. Um, so we can see um, the largest areas are located in um, lower troposphere over land, um, tropical tropopos here, um, and stratosphere over Antarctica over here. Um, um, so the bottom shows the learned percentage. So the blue means the prediction captures the target output, um, and the red means the prediction is making the bias worse. So although um, the prediction skills are limited for some other regions, um, the neural network was able to capture around 80% of these large biased um, regions, except for the tropical tropopause. So we dig more into the tropical tropopause region by training a local neural network focusing only on this region. So the upper right is again the target um, temperature increment, um, but with a more detailed slicing. And it is, it is the largest at the model level, um, right above the uh, maritime continent. So the bottom lab shows um, the learned percentage again for the previous neural network um, for the entire globe. And we can see not only it um, didn't pre uh, predict well um, in the large virus region, it also degrades, um, degrades badly um, elsewhere. Uh, but with the local neural network, we, we were able to reduce um, the degradation 
here and then improve the prediction um, over the large bias region. So this is suggesting that our previous global neural network complexity may be insufficient, at least for the tropical um, tropical pulse region. So now we switch gear to answer the second question, what can we learn from the bias neural network? Um, so here we're using Jacobian of the neural network to measure how does the in, uh, output depend on the input. So um, this is a busy and complicated, uh, complicated figure, and I'll try to walk through the features. I think it's interesting. Um, so the first is the vertical axis, is the, um, um, the input forecast model level, and the horizontal is the output bias on uh, model level. So the green shows positive dependency. Um, uh, so a, a positive temperature forecast anomaly would tend to have code bias. So again, above um, level um, 46 is stratosphere. Um, so the first thing to notice is there is a diagonal pattern in the stratosphere indicating the bias are locally determined here. And the tropical uh, and the troposphere forecast has no indication of the stratospheric bias. So a positive temperature forecast anomaly in stratosphere tend to have local warm bias. Um, so on the country, the uh, tropospheric bias are very different. They are determined by both troposphere and stratosphere with a homogeneous pattern um, throughout the uh, troposphere column. So a positive temperature forecast anomaly at the surface um, indicates not only uh, warm bias at surface, but um, all the way up the, to the mid troposphere. So an interesting feature here is that um, a forecast um, anomaly at level 86 has no indication of local bias, but do indicate the code bias of the entire column below. So there's also an interesting um, separation between mid and lower troposphere. Um, so these features reveal distinct bias characteristics at each model level, and to some extent match our understanding of stratosphere and troposphere and maybe corresponding to physical um, processes like convection and radiate forcing. So if anyone um, has an idea how to link these back to actual model physics, uh, please let me know. Um, so this is very, and this is um, also very useful in designing the neural network architecture. So for example, this block is uh, basically empty. So I did an experiment removing corresponding connection and it improves the scale. So the ultimate goal is to apply the online bias correction to each six hour forecast segment. So this is crucial and real test to us because the analysis increment is not really the truth. And we're just using the neural network to distill useful bias information out of it. So the take home message is that the neural network can extract useful information from the analysis increment and reveal some um, interesting uh, relation between the forecast bias, forecast and bias. Um, and we're looking to improve the current neural network architecture to see if we can extract uh, more information. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. That's a lot to take in. Uh, let's see. Just a reminder that you can ask any questions either now or later in our Slack channel. Uh, channel three, weather and climate. I don't see any right now, so might take a quick second to ask you a question. Did you start with neural networks or did you test a couple models before you decided to stick with the neural network approach? Oh, uh, we go straight to the neural networks. <laughs> And then with your neural network architecture, how much refinement to the actual model did you do? So did you look at different loss functions or something that might be more fitting of the smaller data set that you have and only having one year's worth of models to test on because and train on because, you know, that's going to miss ENSO cycles since those are multi-year events? Um. Yeah, but um, I guess that's the nature of um, doing this work because in order to capture Ansel, we will um, we'll need a data set that covers um, several several years, and like it is almost impossible to have a fixed version of operational uh, model for for that long. Yeah. Um, so that's. Very unfortunate, but we just have to live with it, I guess. Okay, 
And then did you, were you able to look at different loss functions or different neural network structure setups? Um, yeah, so uh, I did test different setups. So I actually, I mentioned that, um, so, so when I, when I look at this um, saliency map and I notice this um, empty, empty space, so empty block over here, um, and I'm wondering, like, if it's basically zero, then maybe um, um, I shouldn't put any neuron, like any resources um, lear learning um, that zero. Um, so I did actually test it, uh, uh, architecture that, um, that is without these um, connection um, of this block. Um, and then it actually improved um, the prediction very well. Okay, yeah, I remember you explaining that, but maybe maybe I had slightly misunderstood. Uh, again, thank you, and keep an eye on Slack. You might have some questions that come in later, but we're going to move on to our next speaker. I would like to introduce John Schreck, who is going to present on accelerating mechanistic simulation of organic chemistry and weather and climate models with machine learning. Can you see my slides are here? Let me hit play real quick. My, my setup has changed suddenly since we tested. Okay, I do need to do the switcheroo. Your presentation looks good from my end and we can hear you. Oh, can you oh, see? Now it doesn't. <laughs> okay, here we go. I gotta go back. Okay, this is what you wanna see. Okay, great. All right, uh, my name is John Schreck. I'm a machine learning scientist here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, today, my talk is titled Accelerating Mechanistic Simulation of Organic Chemistry and, Walk and Weather and Climate Models with Machine Learning. All right, so we are interested in uh, the chemistry involving volatile organic compounds, or VOCs for short. So this drawing illustrates the chemical life cycle of VOCs coming from anthropogenic, biogenic, uh, and as well as biomass burning. Uh, as these VOCs oxidize, they can form secondary organic aerosols or other intermediate compounds. Uh, many of these intermediates can condense into aerosols themselves from the gas phase, uh, which leads to smog and other types of air pollution. So having an understanding of these degradation processes is pretty crucial for understanding air quality and climate applications. I need to go to my next slide. Okay, uh, so VOCs ha have extremely diverse chemistries as is illustrated by this drawing, which is a chemical reaction network. A uh, chemical reaction network is a graph connecting molecular compounds to each other via chemical reactions. Uh, the compounds are represented by nodes or dots or circles in this, in this drawing. Uh, the reactions are represented as edges or blue lines. Uh, the type of reactions involving VOC compounds, which are the red dots here uh, as examples, uh, include daytime and nighttime oxidation, uh, and this can lead to the production of sec secondary compounds, uh, the white dots, uh, which are usually pretty short-lived, uh, but will also participate uh, in other chemical reactions, leading to other compounds and so on and so forth, eventually breaking down all the way down, potentially into carbon monoxide or CO2 and, CO2 and water, uh, which are oftentimes represented as the leaf nodes in a graph here. Okay, so how do we actually like use these kind of results? Um, well, we turn to yeah, chemistry generators. In this particular example, we use something called Gecko A, which is the generator of explicit chemistry and kinetics of organics in the atmosphere. Uh, it's basically a computer program that builds a chemical reaction network around a target of VOC uh, and computes using either known or estimated reaction rate constants, uh, the concentrations of each molecule in the reaction network as a function of time. Uh, so the figure on the top left there shows you an example simulation uh, for gecko uh, for an initial starting condition for dodecane. Uh, you can see that we've grouped the concentrations into three different phases, the precursor, the gas, and the particles, or which we're going to refer to as the aerosol phase. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the plot below that basically shows the relative masses in the different phases. So gecko is really useful. It provides all kinds of mechanistic insight into what's really going on here. But it's very, very, very slow. And we cannot use it in three-dimensional models. Um, but we really want to be able to plug something into warp chem or geos chem. So our objective here basically is to use neural nets to kind of reproduce that top left plot uh, given certain initial conditions. Um, so this is basically the data that we have to work with really. We generate 2000 examples of the top left plot for different initial conditions. Um, we're gonna do that. We've done it for three species, dodecane, alpha pinene, and toluene. 
Um, we let these simulations run out for five days. Uh, we save the data basically every five minutes. Um, you can see on the top right plot for dodecane that in these 2000 <clears throat> examples and these ginormous chemical reaction networks that we generate, we basically visited more than 200,000 molecular species and we saw more than a million chemical reactions. So it's kind of a lot of stuff to try to learn from a neural net, but we're gonna try anyways. Um, so we kind of do the usual stuff with the data. We just split it into train test validate splits and so on. Um, we're gonna consider two models. The first one is a very simple multi-layer perceptron model. Uh, this is illustrated by the diagram here. Uh, the hidden layers are just feed forward layers connected together in the usual way. Uh, the input is a precursor a gas and aerosol at some time T, along with six other environmental variables. Um, they include temperature, solar zenith angle, pre-existing aerosols, ozone, NOx, and OH. Uh, those go into the model and the model outputs the precursor of the gas and the aerosol one time step in, into the future, which is five minutes ahead for us, okay? Uh, so we have 1,600 experiments to work with for training. Um, that's 1,440 data points per experiment. So it's basically 2.8 million points to train with. For the MLP model, we just shuffle all that together. Uh, and we just grab random matches, pass them through the model and update the weights accordingly. Uh, when we validate the model, we then run this model in box mode, which means we start with an initial condition, run it through the model, get a prediction. Then we use that prediction as input to the model again to get another prediction and so on and so forth. We run that 1,440 times. That's how we generate our precursor gas aerosol curves, thus emulating gecko. The second model is a recurrent model. It's kind of similar to an LSTM, but it's a gated recurrent unit instead. It's a little simpler than an LSTM. Uh, has very similar input, precursor gas aerosol environmental variables. Also has another input, which is a hidden state. Um, so the gated recurrent unit will encode the precursor gas and aerosols, which is the black arrow coming out the bottom of it. That gets passed through a fully connected layer, which will then predict the precursor gas aerosol, again, one time step into the future. The gated recurrent unit will also give you a hidden state for the input variables, okay? So when we start the model, we have an initial condition, but we don't have a hidden state. So we need another model to produce a hidden state. That's what the top right model is. It's another multi-layer perceptron, takes in precursor gas aerosol environmental stuff, predicts a hidden state. So when we train this model, it's actually trained in box mode, unlike the MLP. So here we basically have to start at an initial condition and then we run it in box mode and we backprop every time step uh, on a combined loss here, which is really just mean absolute error, uh, plus a little term coming from the hidden state because we need to train that model on the top right as well. Um, at the end of the day, both models have the same philosophy. They're just trying to predict these, these curves that I showed you before. Um, we got the best models through very extensive hyperparameter optimization using a package that we developed here at NCAR called ECHO. Um, the objective was just the MAE on box experiments. And we always started everything at T equals zero, which really just means all precursor, no gas, no aerosol. Um, this plot just shows three different experiments, the columns, the row show the precursor task, the gas task, and the aerosol task. Uh, the dash line shows what we were trying to fit. Uh, the thin line showed different model trains that were had different weight initializations. Uh, and then the thick line is basically the ensemble mean. So it's pretty good performance overall. Pearson's above 95 for all three tasks. You can't actually see it from the figure, but precursor is the hardest to predict. Uh, you can see by the kind of wiggly lines here that there is sensitivity to weight initialization. And overall, this model doesn't very well capture the diurnal signal, which is just like a day-night temperature fluctuation in the data that we have. Uh, it seems to kind of learn the mean. Um, and occasionally this model will predict unphysical concentrations and kind of predict numbers out of scope. Uh, the GRU model does better. Um, <clears throat> the Pearson is higher on all tasks. We don't have as much variation in the ensemble members. And very importantly here, we capture the diurnal signal. Um, unfortunately, both these models, like because they're neural nets, like they still go off the rails. They don't really understand physics. So we do still kind of have to restrain their predictions on occasion when these are plugged into like other models like GeoScam or WorkChem. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna skip this plot here. I just wanna show with my last couple of slides here, uh, trying to use some interpretation methods uh, to try to figure out basically what dependency the model has on the inputs when it makes a prediction. Uh, so in order to probe that, we use SHAP, uh, which is shapely additive values. I think I got that right there. Uh, this just this measures how much the value of an input feature affects the prediction task. And that's relative to an average background when you do interpretation methods like this. Okay, so the two columns just show the MLP model on the left, the GRU model on the right. Uh, the y, stuff on the y-axis is basically the model prediction tasks. And in this figure here, what's shown in the legend are the inputs to the model. 
Okay, so both models kind of show somewhat similar things, in particular for this experiment, uh, this dependency on OH. In particular, it seems like we have more precursor compared to the average. So that must mean less gas and aerosol for this particular value of OH. Uh, we see other things like ozone doesn't really influence anything here. Um, uh, and also very interestingly, you can kind of see the red curve here in the GRU model, uh, which is the temperature influence here. And note how the gas and the aerosol are basically 90 degrees out of phase from each other. But this, is a, this makes sense because like as the temperature goes down, we get less of one quantity, more of the other. And it's a diurnal signal. So it's basically a cyclic kind of relationship. These are things that we expect to be consistent with what we see in the actual explicit gecko simulations. So overall, the neural nets do seem to be like kind of getting some of the chemistry. It's not, again, like the last week kind of note, it's kind of hard to really say how to really quantify that. Um, I tried another way by just computing bulk SHAP across different the experiments for the different uh, tasks. This actually shows you for the three different kind of molecules that we used here, toluene, dodecane, alpha pinene. Uh, I think overall, if I had to have you a take-home message here, the GRU gives you a bit more of a nuanced sort of like interpretation of uh, you know the relevance of the chemistry that you're using as inputs and what you're trying to predict. Uh, the MLP model seems to kind of just focus on like what went in previously and then what came out most recently. So what I mean by that is like we had input precursor. So that, that has the most effect on the output value that the model predicts for precursor. Whereas the GRU, you know, it's more nuanced dependency as noted. Um, so I've just left some summary bullet points here. I won't go over them all. They're kind of more for you to review later on if you're interested. Um, and I just want to thank in particular, Charlie Becker, Keely Lawrence, David John Gagne, who are the main drivers in this project from the machine learning side. Uh, and our chemistry team here uh, at eight was Alma Hajik, Siwan, and others as noted here. Um, thank you very much. Wow, that was so much in such a little time, John. Great talk. Um, I haven't seen any questions come through in the Slack just yet, so I will start with some that I have. The first one is what stands out for your training data set is you have so many training data points. You said something like 2.8 million. That's something a lot of us in environmental science don't often get. So how many unique things are you trying to train from that 2.8 million? So if you're looking at aerosol and gas properties, you know, what is the number of different things that it's that that training set is trying to replicate? Is that a understandable question? Yeah, I mean, so uh, the size of our dating set is, is really dependent on like how many different experiments we want to run with Gecko. So I know that we ran like 2000 each, which cost a lot of C computation time here at NCAR. So in a way, it's kind of how well do you really want to sample your initial conditions, which we did try to put gotcha. some into that, right? And it may seem like it's a lot. Um, We're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> how did you know which metric and method to evaluate your model off of? So I know myself and then maybe some other folks listening might not have heard of a SHAP. So how did you know to look at that? And is that something that more of us should be using when evaluating our models? Or is it more specific to your type of problem that you're solving? Uh, so these interpretability methods, I think to some extent, it depends on like what you're trying to do. Like are you using image data? Are you using language, like sequential data? In, my, in this case, like we're, this is a regression problem for both models. And SHAP is, is, for these types of models, was the appropriate one. Like I wouldn't use like, LRP or something for images on numerical data, for instance. But uh, the specific algorithm that I implemented was a bit of a trying to figure out which one was the fastest to run because these interpretability algorithms can be rather slow. I did have to parallelize everything on the GPU. So a bit tricky. Wow. And then I guess my last question is you did mention about some of your unphysical issues in a few of your machine learning model outputs. Um, how frequent were those? And you, you briefly touched on what you were doing to try to address them. Right now, do you just, if it hits that on physical concentration, toss it out? Uh, so I would say if you predict a negative concentration and like suppose I've got this 
neural net plugged into Morph Chem, don't you don't you don't use a negative concentration, you use zero. Now, I mean, you can guardrail sort of upstream and like when it's a neural net's kind of plugged in, it would be more ideal to just not have the neural net do that. Um, there are, yeah, we'll talk about it in our paper when we eventually publish it because there is, we have been worried about that a lot, really. Because even though the model looks pretty good, like sometimes it just is, it will blow up wharf if you're doing a simulation with it. Yeah, and that's something to have to pay attention to, especially when you have 2.8 million training points, you wouldn't think it would be eager to throw something unrealistic at you, but here we are. <laughs> um, I thank you for your talk and again, encourage people if you digest his talk later and then have future questions to post them in our Slack channel and would now like to introduce Marco to give a presentation on Bayesian deep learning for addressing uncertainty precipitation type detection. Hello, Christina. Thank you for introduction. Let me share my screen. All right, please let me know if you can see my full screen. Your screen looks good. Great, thank you. So my name is Professor Marco Areskanin. I am from the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, uh, I will talk today about Bayesian deep learning as the main focus, and then uh, we will apply to precipitation type detection case study. I would also like to introduce some of my collaborators. So Dr. Veljko Petković is also here uh, in, the, in the chat, and he'll be also helping with answering some questions in the Slack that are more atmospheric science related. Uh, and I also wanted to, you know, emphasize here that, uh, you know, Naval Postgraduate School is a unique institution. We educate active duty officers and two of the students that have helped with this work and have graduated on these topics are Captain Benjamin Marsh of United States Marine Corps and First Lieutenant Sean Haslin, United States Air Force MeTOC officer. So let me begin the presentation. So uh, here really what, what the goal is, and I, I hope all of you have seen this from the workshop, is that deep learning truly offers a path to utilizing more information that are present in some observations, right, compared to parametric approaches that depend on understanding underlying physics. Right, and that's both good and bad. You know, we always want to include as much of the physics understanding as we can in developing these models. Uh, however, rather than focusing on that aspect, right, we really focused on the on this lack of these deterministic deep learning models that are being currently used that they don't have the ability to provide uncertainty in estimation. Right, like we, we figured out a long time ago that, hey, if we have some kind of an estimate and we have an uncertainty, we can do a sensor fusion, right? And, and in my work, I've really tried to emphasize this aspect of treating a neural network as a synthetic sensor. And in order to do that, I need to have some kind, type of uncertainty estimation once I have a prediction, right? So let me introduce, uh, Bayesian neural networks and how do we produce these uncertainty maps, right? So typically, and I'm using here, you know, I'm referencing Blundell's work, who was one of the first ones to talk about this at, in, in a meaningful manner from optimization perspective, but your typical neural network here on the left-hand side, right, your multilayer perceptron has fixed weights. They're just, you know, numbers that we'll learn. Uh, whether if you start thinking about a Bayesian on the right-hand side, and this is the same neural network, but the difference is that instead of having single weights uh, that connect the neurons, we model distributions. So we assume distributions over weights, right? So this is this probability P of amigo. Uh, how does that work out from the model development perspective? And what are some of the assumptions that we make? And what is the loss function that we use? Right, so let me introduce the setting. So uh, we talk about supervised learning typically, and for that we define our data set, right, with uh, input features and labels. Uh, and uh, here I'm just defining that my labels, you know, this is a classification problem. Uh, so I have up to C classes, right? And then typically when we talk about inference, which is making prediction on new samples, right? I can define with my equation one that inference. And as you see that inference has an integral for formulation uh, that depends on prior. So as you look at these descriptions, you see that I'm now starting to blend uh, Bayesian approach, Bayesian probabilistic approach uh, with what I've told you previously about neural network weights. In, in equation two, uh, what's happening here is that this integration 
over the prior is intractable because that, that you can have infinitely many distributions. Uh, and in approximate inference, we can approximate that prior, and then further using what's called variational inference, which my work is based on, uh, we can show that we can uh, in practice fit a family of parametric distributions here called Q theta of omega, right, in order to approximate that prior, which when we put all of these pieces together, uh, drives us to this uh, negative evidence lower bound loss function, which is used for training Bayesian neural network models. So that loss function here has two terms. The first term here, likely many of you are recognizing that is your likelihood, uh, which for typical classification problem, we represent as categorical cross entropy, right? And it has this regularization term, uh, which is a KL divergence, which is a measure uh, of distance between uh, our prior distribution or the distribution that we assumed over the weights of the neural network and this posterior approximation. So the penalty that that function, the way that it penalizes us whenever we try to diverge too much from our prior assumption, right? There's a penalty on the loss function and it affects how we learn and optimize in training these models. Now, uh, how do you do a prediction with the probabilistic neural network? So the way that uh, this numerically works out is that you do what's called a Monte Carlo integration. Uh, that means that you would make uh, multiple predictions with your neural network model. Uh, and you, would, you can average those predictions to get a mean estimate and then get, again, this argmax uh, uh, for the correct class. And in order to estimate an uncertainty, right, because you have this ensemble of predictions, uh, we can, for instance, uh, use a predictive entropy that we can extract uh, from these predictions. Now, uh, let me introduce the application. So I showed you what's the kind of backbone of the theory of the probabilistic deep learning. And what we apply this to is to uh, predicting precipitation using passive microwave measurements. Uh, so we use this global precipitation measurement GP emission microwave imager, GMI, and the mounted on a dual polarization radar, DPR. Uh, and what we use, we use the DPR to label data from GMI for convective versus stratiform precipitation type detection. And we focus on developing this global over the ocean model, model where no ground radar is available to provide information on precipitation type. And we, we had the initial effort that was published uh, in 2019 uh, with deterministic neural network models. And then in this you know, work, we expanded it to include probabilistic models because we're really interested in having a large scale data set to study Bayesian inference with neural networks. Now, our data and models, so we developed two independent 12 month periods of GMI and DPR data observations. They were collocated uh, where we used 2017 for training and 2018 for testing. Uh, when you think about input feature size, uh, you know, we're talking about nine by 25 patches of 13 channels. And we had about 14 million feature examples once we collocated all of the data from 2017. So this is one of the largest data sets used for this type of study. Uh, you know, the DPR provided label, as I said, for each of the input features to, you know, classify it as stratiform versus convective precipitation. And then we use standard ResNet architectures that we adopted with Bayesian definitions to make them into probabilistic Bayesian models. So how did we perform? So on the, you know, this is a reference to our paper. The, this is already published. Uh, so when we compared to previously published work that we did in 2019 compared to this MLP model, that MLP model on, on, on the similar task achieved about 68.73% accuracy on our test data uh, with, uh, with, with newer models like deterministic ResNet, uh, we achieved 86% accuracy. And then by utilizing uh, Bayesian configuration of ResNet models, uh, we pushed that performance to you know, 93% uh, in accuracy. Although I do prefer to look at area under the curve and precision recall just to show uh, that we used a balanced data set. So our 
accuracy metric is meaningful when we talk about a performance. We also use here an ensemble of 25 prediction. Now, why probabilistic models? There, you know, when I show you an estimate, there's just an estimate met metric like any other. But what you can do when you have that entropy or the uncertainty, uh, we can show here that we can produce a calibrated uncertainty. So let me orient you a little bit in this figure. Right, so what I'm showing here on the left hand side is the area under the uh, ROC curve as a performance metric. And on the right hand side, I have accuracy. And on the bottom, I'm showing the ratio of data retained based on the predictive entropy. So if I was all the way to the right hand side, right, that, that would be where I have my performance if I using the 100% of all of the data, meaning that I use uh, the whole data set. And then as I start filtering based off of entropy, meaning that I start rejecting uh, most uncertain samples, I start increasing my model performance as expected, right? Because if I ditch the most uncertain samples, everything that's left, I should have better performance on it. And this is what this curve is demonstrating that yes, I can produce calibrated uncertainty with probabilistic models. Now, the, the next aspect of this that's, that's very important is we, we used and uh, we applied our model then on a case study from 2018, uh, where we are looking at a subtropical marine mesoscale convective system located near shallow convection on 11th August of 2018 over the North Atlantic. And then uh, I have that divided into two regions in region one, which is north of the 40, 34 degrees is this MCS and R2 represents the south of 34, uh, which has the shallow convection. Now, what you see in these four panels, uh, we're showing what is the operational algorithm prediction. So this is a GPROF algorithms prediction, which is a standard product provided by NASA. Uh, the label is here. So this is your ground truth. We use this uh, DPI radar to provide that ground truth. Uh, this is the Bayesian model prediction relative to that ground truth. And this is our uncertainty or, or the predictive entropy. Uh, and what I want to emphasize here is that the high entropy represents high uncertainty. Low entropy means that model is more certain in prediction. Uh, the performance overall is that uh, the, you know, we have correctly classified uh, about 78.2% of pixels in R1 uh, with, the, with the probabilistic Bayesian model, where GPROF classified uh, only 53.7% accurately. And then in R2 region, uh, you know, GPROF you know, achieves about 61.9% and the Bayesian model achieves 67.8%. And then, you know, in general, when we look at the entropy, the, the predictive entropy is much larger in R2 than in R1, where shallow convection is present. Uh, in fact, you know, when you think about it, many of the DPR stratiform classifications of the edges of shallow convective cores may have been incorrect, meaning that even our label could have been incorrect. Uh, but if we use, you know, the previous plot that I've shown you was related to this. If we use the uncertainty and we start rejecting these samples, we can achieve much higher performance. Now, this was, you know, one of the first times that somebody shown the spatial uncertainty map like this. So in conclusion, you know, Bayesian deep learning provides information on uncertainty in neural network predictions that can be used to boost the trust of the model output or to assimilate prediction with DA system if you're treating it as a synthetic sensor. Now, our best performing model was the ResNet 38 V2 with ensemble of size 25, which achieved about 93% accuracy on the classification task while simultaneously providing an estimate at pixel level scales. Like that's a very novel thing to see in this type of applications. Now, overall, you know, I would like to acknowledge my sponsors, especially ONR32 Marine Meteorology, as well as my collaborator uh, has been funded by NOAA grant uh, through Cooperative Institute for Satellite Earth System Studies, uh, CISIS. Uh, thank you all, and I am open to questions. Oh, thank you so much, Marco. And unfortunately, we have to uh, address those questions in the Slack due to time. But I did want to thank you for showing so much math that speaks to my applied math background. And I think your methods are very useful 
and I'm glad to see the improvement that they had on your models. I would like to direct his questions to the Slack channel again and now introduce Steve Penny, who is going to tell us about integrating uh, AI or machine learning with data assimilation for data-driven state estimation. Hi, okay, so my name is Steve Penny. Um, I work at Ceres and at NOAA PSL. I have a number of collaborators here at Ceres and PSL as well as uh, at UCSD and at RMI. Sorry, I'm trying to switch to full screen. There we go. All right, so in summary, I'm gonna start with an introduction to recurrent neural networks and reservoir computing. Um, since I know there's a wide background of recurrent neural network or background of people who are familiar with perhaps recurrent neural networks or data assimilation, I'll give an analogy between the two to provide some connection for those who might not be familiar with the other. I'll talk a little bit about our approach and results and then some applications of recurrent neural networks integrated with data simulation. And then I'll give a brief review. So our motivation, data simulation, uh, as was mentioned a couple, in a couple of the talks, provides a means to initialize numerical weather forecasts and is updated regularly, uh, typically in atmospheric applications about every six hours. Uh, app, and it's updated with new observations to provide an improved best guess of the state of the atmosphere. So what's important here for us is that this time scale of the prediction that we need to, to be accurate is relatively short. Um, global weather forecast models currently are, are bottleneck in data simulation algorithms. They're one of the most costly component of the DA algorithms. So as you scale to larger models, this is exacerbated and becomes more of a challenge for doing research in this area. The main areas where data simulation uh, methods rely on the numerical models are basically the ensemble-based dynamic forecast error covariance estimation, so the estimation of uncertainty effectively, and outer loop iterations um, within optimization algorithms such as 4 var So it's our expectation that if we can get fast approximations of the numerical model, we can produce the necessary features to substitute these components like the ensemble forecast, or the nonlinear model in the outer loop, which can give us a significant speed up in our data simulation algorithms. And as a um, corollary, we expect that we should get some improvement in understanding as we try to train machine learning models to predict the weather, we should also get better understanding of what elements are needed in our numerical models to do a good job at prediction. So I'll start with recurrent neural networks. So one of the most popular neural network architectures for modeling time-dependent data sources. We're using a type called reservoir computing, which has been demonstrated in a range of dynamics from simple models all the way up to the uh, ECMWF era five reanalysis data set. Um, and one of the key elements of reservoir computing, it's been shown to um, reproduce uh, important invariant properties of dynamical systems one of which is the Lyapunov spectrum. So the reason why the Lyapunov spectrum is important to us is that it describes the average exponential growth rates of small perturbations. This is needed in generating ensemble forecasts. It's also needed in doing optimization or applying optimization in algorithms such as 4D var. The presence of at least one positive Lyapunov exponent indicates a chaotic system. Um, and a key point here is that only the Lyapunov vectors that correspond to the leading non-negative non Lyapunov exponents need to be represented by the data simulation system because that's basically isolating the subspace that, is, that has errors that are growing over time. And typically that is a low dimensional space uh, in, a, in a local region in the um, atmospheric domain. So why is that valuable? So basically we get we found that if we get better reproduction of a Lyapunov spectrum, 
in the reservoir computing model, this implies that we get more accurate forecasts. We've also found that if we have better reproduction of the local Lyapunov spectrum that is calculated over a short time period, um, local to where you are making your forecast, um, that spectrum, if identified correctly, also implies that we get a more accurate reproduction of the forecast error covariance, which describes short time scale uncertainties effectively. Uh, and together we can use these, and this implies that we are able to, we can, can constrain large hidden reservoir states by using conventional data simulation methods. Because again, we only need to constrain the, uh, this, the low dimensional unstable growing space and our reservoir computing has to match the original model or else we don't get good predictions. So if we get good predictions with the reservoir computing model, we have, uh, we have only the constraints to um, keep in check that growing airspace. So as I mentioned, I give an analogy between reservoir computing and data assimilation for those who might maybe weren't familiar with one, but not the other. So if we start with a basic recurrent neural network structure, you can think of the hidden state as the model dynamics. Um, so if in data simulation, we'll make a forecast, this would be analogous to the hidden state. Um, and nature or the observations that we're trying to take from nature and draw into our system are analogous to the data set. And so at each time step, we draw observations into the system from nature and use this to drive our model. Now, in the reservoir, in the recurrent neural network structure, you're trying to train the model itself. But in data simulation, let's assume that the model is trained. We want to make predictions by using uh, this input of data to drive the model towards the true state of the system. So we can think of this second equation as our observation operator, which maps the model dynamics to the observed state. And this is where data simulation usually operates is on this difference between the observed state and our modeled state. And then we can apply this iteratively over time. At each time step, we bring in new observations and we correct the state of the model. The reservoir computing that we're using is a simplification of the recurrent neural network. Basically, we assume that all of the parameters defined by these matrices, W res, W in, are fixed and random, assigned at the beginning. And we only train these uh, what we call macro scale parameters, which apply a weighting to these matrices. Um, and we do that via Bayesian optimization. And then our readout is a simple linear operator. This can be uh, determined via linear regression. So if we have a typical data simulation system, we have uh, the model trajectory usually and the nature trajectory, which is unknown. We sample nature via an observation and bring that to what we call the observation space. We also can create a simulated observation to bring the model space to the same um, place and make comparisons of those observations. What we're doing here is adding a, a fourth trajectory a space, which we use the hidden reservoir state and we apply our readout mapping to take us back to the model space. And then we use a composition operator of the observation operator and readout applied to that hidden reservoir space. And now again, we can compare in the same space. So this is the main um, innovation we have in being able to apply data simulation to the recurrent neural network structure. And in comparison, if we start with say, just direct insertion of observations, as soon as we take the time step of the updates to be larger than the model step. In this case, we have an update every five model time steps. And we create a sparser observing network. So in this case, we're observing only the first, second, and fourth nodes of the Lorenz 96 system in this example. Uh, direct insertion fails immediately. We never are able to constrain our forecast to, or, and state estimate to match the true system. But if we use a more sophisticated method like an ensemble transform common filter or 40 var, where we actually use what we've gained from the reservoir computing, which is some estimate of the error growth uh, based on small perturbations from initial conditions. In this case, we can use an ensemble common filter and we're able to capture not only the observed state where we have data, and in this case, even less frequently, every 20 model time steps, but are actually also able to constrain the unobserved states using the covariance statistics that we attain from our reservoir 
a, a recurrent neural network. So we can also scale this up. We uh, apply this locally at random uh, at a set of different patches using different random initial states. Um, we can apply our data assimilation. Say we select a, a specific patch. We can use observations at and around that patch and bring them in and apply our data assimilation algorithm, whatever it may be, ensemble transfer coma filter or 40 var, and use this to update all the uh, each one of the local patches, provide that to create a new state estimate, and then use that to feed forecast for the, uh, the next time step. And we've applied that here to the Lorenz 96 system scaling from what I showed before, which was a six dimensional system up to 40, but it could be arbitrarily large. And we apply this combination of localization schemes that I just described to do something effectively like the local ensemble transform common filter. And while there's a bit of a spit up here, spin up period, um, it quickly converges. We have stability of the system and that stability is maintained um, for, for that point forward. Uh, and at this phase, we're now trying to scale this up to larger, uh, high, high resolution systems. We've started uh, applying it to the high resolution Gulf of Mexico data. Here it's uh, data that's available at 125th degree resolution. And here's an example of making a prediction for a 12 by 12 kilometer patch that uh, is a forecast of sea surface temperature. And we're working towards uh, uh, applying this as well um, with our data assimilation methods. So in summary, we've developed a method to integrate the AI machine and machine learning forecast model, in this case, a recurrent neural network or, or is a variant of reservoir computing with conventional scalable data assimilation methods. So there, we're on a path in which there's nothing that really indicates that there was some, would be something to prevent us from applying this at scale. Um, there will be more in the next session about our improved understanding of AI and ML from using this for forecast applications from Jason Platt, who, who will be speaking in the next session. Also in our group, we're doing another of other activities, which I didn't have time to talk about today, such as developing emulators for coupled atmosphere ocean dynamics, um, looking at improving and understanding uh, our, uh, improving our understanding of challenges, applying 40 VAR to coupled atmosphere ocean system, and incorporating uh, data-driven estimates of uh, tangent linear model and adjoint dynamics, uh, developing an, an initialization strategy for S2S forecast time scales, subseasonal to seasonal, where we're trying to identify um, spaces that are invariant over longer time scales that we can use for data simulation um, from data. And um, earlier in this session, you heard from Chun Chen, who is uh, looked at bias correction in the FE3 GFS. And so to, in conclusion, I'd like to mention that um, we have a position opening at Ceres and the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory for just this work that I described. Um, and if you're interested, please uh, check out this link. And thanks. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, it was a very insightful talk and I appreciate seeing how our PSL is coming in some of this work and especially how your models seem to be stable. That's really promising. Unfortunately, you'll have to take any questions that you have on the Slack channel. And sure. um, we're going to move on now to our final speaker, who is Matthew Brothers. He will be giving a presentation on random forest approach for improving non-convective high wind forecasting across Southeast Wyoming. All right, Matthew, the floor is yours. Cool. You can see my slide? I can see your slide. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, this has been a project that both Chris and I have been working on here at the Weather Service Office in Cheyenne over uh, probably about the past year or so. And the main motivation for it is uh, strong winds are pretty frequent during the uh, winter months uh, across our area, uh, especially with interstates 80 and 25 that run through that area. And are relatively busy uh, as far as commercial truck traffic goes. Uh, strong crosswinds uh, are actually pretty frequent and can cause blowovers of some of these uh, trucks and um, cause accidents, shut down highways. Um, and a lot of the forecast models uh, have trouble resolving um, some local terrain features such as localized gaps. Uh, and that results in um, a under forecast in some of the winds in these locations. 
So some previous work uh, that has been done uh, by our office uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, they looked at correlating uh, uh, height gradients with wind gusts at one of those gap locations, which is Arlington, Wyoming. And they found a Craig, Colorado to Casper, Wyoming uh, height gradient at the 700 and uh, 850 millibar levels uh, was a pretty good predictor, especially right around the 50 to 60 meter range for uh, those high wind gusts. And additionally, uh, 2015 study, uh, which Chris was a part of, they developed a pair of logistic regression models uh, for two other sites, uh, Bordeaux, which is another gap location, as well as Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, to predict the probability of exceeding local high wind criteria. Uh, these were multi-parameter models that took in about three to five predictors, uh, and they are currently what's used by our operational forecasters uh, when uh, making decisions on high wind warnings. And so uh, that is something we're both working on, uh, trying to create additional tools uh, to make improvements. So uh, our study domain, uh, this is pretty much our coverage area for the National Weather Service office in Cheyenne. Uh, it covers Southeast Wyoming and Western Nebraska. And the three initial sites uh, that we have developed uh, rainforest models for uh, are shown there in red uh, with Arlington and Bordeaux being more of those gap locations and Cheyenne, uh, more, more so uh, down sloping winds is, is the main driver for high winds. So we gathered some data uh, from Meso West, uh, which was mostly for highway sensors from the Wyoming Department of Transportation, as well as Iowa State Mesonet uh, for METAR data, uh, especially at Cheyenne. And that data was collected all the way back to October uh, 2010. So about 10 winters worth of data was collected. Uh, and that included wind speeds, uh, direction, as well as uh, um, peak winds from the METAR. Uh, and then we took this data and calculated a few fields such as uh, the maximum one hour sustained winds and maximum gusts uh, at three hour intervals. Uh, and we used kind of a, a window of plus or minus 90 minutes around those three hour intervals that ends up matching our predictor variables timing. Uh, we also took those maximum gusts and max one hour sustained winds and classified them uh, as seen below. Uh, which does include that high wind classification, which is our local high wind criteria of wind gusts greater than 58 miles per hour uh, and or a one hour sustained winds greater than 40 miles per hour. As far as our predictors goes, go, we uh, gather data from the North American Regional Reanalysis, uh, such as winds, heights, temperature omega at various levels, uh, and we also derived some data uh, from that. So that included height gradients to get that, uh, like Craig to Casper gradient that was mentioned earlier, as well as a few others, uh, and also lapse rates and, and so on. And so this data is every three hours, uh, 10 years worth of winter months collected. So for our random force setup, uh, we use the first eight years of that data set as training. Uh, and for hyperparameter tuning, we used an eightfold cross-validation method. Uh, so that way, uh, each year um, got to be the testing data set within that validation method uh, once. Uh, and so we use that for hyperparameter tuning. And then the final two years uh, was used as our testing data set. Now, we didn't use all the uh, predictors we extracted from the NAR, but we limited it based off of correlations uh, to high wind occurrences, uh, uh, as well as uh, individual CSI performances uh, for each parameter. And I'll explain that here in one minute. Uh, and so we came out to about 20 to 30 predictors uh, for each of our sites. Uh, as seen there in the bottom left. So for that CSI score analysis, um, what we did was we looked at all the predictors and chose select thresholds and only use that one predictor to try and predict whether or not there would be high winds uh, at the given location. So if you look at the heat map on the right, that is the Craig to Casper gradients. Uh, and this is for the Arlington site. On the y-axis, you got that height gradient at different uh, pressure levels. Uh, and then the x-axis is different uh, gradients that uh, 
gradient thresholds that were used for that prediction. Uh, and so we can see the 750 millibar current to Casper gradient had the maximum CSI score when it was only used to predict high winds. Uh, and so we analyzed all the different predictors and, and made our selections uh, based off this. Uh, additionally, uh, we tried to avoid using too many uh, correlated or highly correlated predictors. Uh, so both the 750 and 770. 75 current Casper gradients uh, showed pretty you know, the highest CSI scores. So we really just picked one not to have too many very similar predictors in the model. As far as verification goes, uh, we use two different uh, methods, uh, but overall we use the probability of detection, false alarm ratio, and the critical success index. Uh, and so the first method, they were just used by calculating exactly um, at the exact times that the data was uh, present for. So uh, that was our more observation-based method. And so if we look at the table at the bottom uh, inside the red box, uh, that first row shows an observed high wind classification, uh, but the model predicted an elevated classification. So that would be considered a miss. Uh, and then the next one uh, would be considered a false alarm. However, uh, when we're forecasting for high winds here at the Weather Service in Cheyenne, timing is important, but we usually kind of group things together more as uh, an event. Uh, and so based off of how we defined events, uh, all five of these rows would have been considered a single event. Uh, and this high wind uh, event would have been considered a hit by the model using event-based verification. So how did the uh, random forest models do? Uh, here's a quick look at performance diagrams. On the uh, left is the observation-based method, and on the right is the event-based method. And um, with these performance diagrams, uh, pretty much uh, the best scores are in the upper right-hand corner of the diagram. That is where your CSI scores are maximized. Uh, as, as far as the points, uh, the crosses uh, represent the operational model that is currently being used, whether it's the logistic regression models, or just looking at Craig DeCasper grains for the Arlington uh, site. And then the circles show the uh, random forest models. And so overall, what we've seen is it, it's an improvement uh, um, based off of previous guidance that's being used. Uh, these random forest models uh, definitely uh, show better scores over our testing data set using uh, the NAR. So a quick little case review that uh, we'll jump into uh, just to look at, you know, one event. So this is from this past March. And we can see uh, on the uh, surface, uh, uh, surface plots uh, across southeast Wyoming, this is on the 28th of March, uh, pretty tight pressure gradient developing across um, Wyoming and, and southeast Wyoming. Uh, and then uh, fast forward 24 hours, uh, we do have a, a low movement across North Dakota with a cold front uh, stemming down from that, uh, that low across our area. And looking up at 700 millibars, you can see that front again, as well as some fairly tight uh, 700 millibar height gradients. Uh, and uh, if, if you could look a little bit closer, it's at least 50 knots of flow uh, at 700 millibars, which isn't too far off the uh, surface here in Southeast Wyoming. So pretty much uh, as far as the model, how it performed, the bottom left graphic shows uh, the random forest model probabilities for uh, the Arlington site uh, with the red line showing the probabilities for high winds. Uh, and then the very small uh, and numerous scatter points are observed wind gusts uh, also color coded based off of the classification they would fall into. And so overall, it, it predicts the timing of, of the elevated uh, two high winds uh, very well across this event. Uh, and even on the diagram to the right with uh, multiple GFS runs, uh, it really picks out um, uh, this event five days in advance. And so that's one thing uh, we did train based off of the North American regional reanalysis. However, that is not a, a forecast model. So this is one of those first cases we really started to examine uh, using GFS data as the inputs uh, into this model. And that was what was done with the previous work that was developed with those logistic regression models. Uh, again, looking at our two other sites for the same case, uh, on the left, we have the Bordeaux site. 
uh, which once again does a pretty good job of uh, predicting uh, those high winds and especially compared to that previously developed guidance, which is shown in the blue line. Uh, you can see that max out uh, a little bit earlier than the random forest high wind probabilities. Uh, it ends up being a, uh, a false alarm for that previously developed guidance uh, versus the random forest model then begins to peak out with its probabilities and you do get uh, some occurrences of high wind gusts uh, at that time. And then we have the Cheyenne model, uh, which uh, we will continue to work with. But um, right now, the high wind probabilities were pretty low in this case, but it was still nice to see uh, that those probabilities did peak out uh, at the time that high winds did occur. Uh, at Cheyenne. What about wind speed and gust estimates? So using the classifier, uh, you know, they are defined by uh, different uh, wind magnitudes. Uh, however, the output from the model is really just giving us a confidence or probability uh, that that class will occur and uh, not as much information about um, how strong the winds might be, whether they might be at the base of high wind criteria, which is 58 miles per hour for gusts, or you might get gusts up to 80 miles per hour. Uh, so uh, we are starting to explore, and Chris is working a lot with this, it's the random forced regressor to try and provide additional details, uh, not only to forecasters, but to some of our core partners like the Wyoming Department of Transportation on uh, how strong winds might be and maybe the most likely timing for the strongest winds in an event. And looking at this graphic on the right in blue, we have the regressor estimate. Uh, in the uh, black line is the observed wind gust, uh, which uh, matches up fairly well for this event. Um, and then the uh, circles, uh, the scatter points on the black line show what the classifier were to predict. So we can see during an extended period of time, the classifier is predicting high winds, but you know, it's important to find out, you know, is it just gonna be these lower, you know, right around the criteria thresholds, or, or is it going to be uh, 80 miles per hour, which it was in this case. So uh, that's some important information uh, for us forecasters and we'll continue to, continue to explore that. So uh, with that, uh, I'll just thank you guys for listening and I'll leave up our conclusions and future work and uh, take any questions. Thank you so much, Matthew. I'm going to choose to leave my video off due to my internet having technical difficulties. Uh, I see one question right now in the Slack in our few minutes remaining. In training with the NARR, but running with the GFS, have you looked at differences in predictions and predictors between NARR and GFS for events, especially the misses? to understand if predictor quality impacts your random forest model. Yeah, um, yeah. so we've also been looking at, um, we've created a few plots to look at in real time uh, where it shows um, the G GFS uh, variables, uh, what they're predicting, uh, as well as kind of, we, we overlay uh, violin plots of what the NAR training data set were, what it had for each of the different classifications. And, and overall, uh, most of the data seems to be well within, um, kind of all the GFS data seems to be well within the distribution of the NAR. Uh, one exception though we have noticed uh, is uh, at one of the sites, the Arlington site, uh, the GFS data seems to uh, definitely predict much lower uh, omega values than what the NAR uh, can uh, produce. And, and mainly that's probably attributed to uh, the differences in resolution uh, of the two. Uh, the NAR is about 30 kilometers. And so it probably has a little bit more trouble resolving the terrain right around the location uh, of Arlington, which sits just on the foothills of the snowy range in Southeast Wyoming. So that is one thing we've looked at, uh, but overall it doesn't seem like it is making the model overly confident in those, in those cases. Thank you. Good answer. I'm going to post a question to Slack to follow up, but we are at the end of our session. I want to thank everybody for joining. I want to thank the speakers for giving such good presentations. After a 15 minute break, this same topic is going to continue. So please look for that link and we will see you later on.